Laura asks, um, please help. I've been waiting to ask, um, my ferritin level is five. How much iron should I take to bring this level up to normal? Is a level of five ferritin mean I'm anemic? Most likely, Laura, but it's not just ferritin. Ferritin is just one marker. Ferritin is iron storage. And so um, if, we, if we think about iron storage, yeah, ferritin can mean your iron storage is low, but what is your serum iron level? Your serum iron should, you know, menstruating females, ideally serum iron at least 70 plus is what you're looking to try to achieve. So if your serum iron is 70 and your hemoglobin is normal and your hematocrit is normal but your ferritin is low, you might not be anemic per se. You might just not have enough iron storage, in which case um, this would be, you could maybe get by by doing some things like liver or iron-rich foods. Um, you may need some iron, but again, depending, I'd say you, you don't just make the decision to supplement iron without understanding what your iron, your hemoglobin, your hematocrit are, um, or your redistribution width. It's another marker on a CBC that can be very helpful. Um, and then, then you can make a better decision. But if, let's just say you were anemic and your, you know, your iron or your ferritin rather being that low, you know, you would be very, very safe um, you know, to take anywhere between 50 and 100 milligrams of iron a day in a nice chelated form. You can check out Ultra Iron. That's a gluten-free preparation. And, um, and, and that's very safe to take. Where, where you got to be careful with iron, though, too, is if sometimes certain people, iron constipates them, right? So just what we were just talking about, which is transit time, you know, you know, if you slow down your transit time by trying to correct an anemia, um, you know, that's not going to help you in other ways, right? Creating a constipation issue might, might be detrimental to you in other ways. So you got to be just be cautious around taking iron supplementation and knowing that it can, can possibly cause constipation. And, uh, and I, th I think that's important that you get those other tests measured as well, because one, one of the, you know, again, these oftentimes are low, but then you also have something else that can cause low ferritin, and that's occult blood loss, which this is where really you want to get it checked out, right? I know you mentioned you didn't really trust your doctor, but you got to find somebody you can trust because occult blood loss is one of the reasons that we'll see low ferritin. And one of the reasons why we see occult blood loss is GI damage. Your gut is damaged in such a way that you're bleeding in the upper intestine or in the stomach, and you're losing blood through that blood loss and you're losing iron through that blood loss and so it, it's occult blood loss because you don't know it's happening right and this can be measured for and so that's important too if you're anemic is to is to look at this and make sure you don't have that occult blood loss it's very common in gluten sensitive individuals especially celiacs to have occult blood loss and so anyway those are all just concerns that you would want to get checked um, let's see Yeah, so Lisa commented, I like this, Lisa, thanks for chiming in. So she says, for me, the Immune Shield powder helps speed the healing process if I get gluten, also Ultra Q. Why does Gluten Shield only seem to promote diarrhea and more cramping for me? You may be reactive to um, some of the other ingredients in Gluten Shield because there's a few other ingredients. It's not just the enzymes itself. Um, if, but if you find that Immune Shield is helpful, one of the reasons why is Immune Shield is a binding protein, right? It's, it's a binding protein, an antibody binding protein. And so what it can do is it can bind toxins in the gut and help you poop them out quicker. And that's probably why that helps your recovery. Ultra Q is a very strong plant-based anti-inflammatory that acts on, in the same area, so mechanistically or chemically speaking, quercetin is an anti-inflammatory the way a steroid is an anti-inflammatory without the negative punch that steroids give, and that's why um, you feel better when you do those things. Um, Jacqueline says, I have severe GERD and was on panaprazole and uh, sol sulcrophate both twice daily but stopped one month ago but still have horrible symptoms. I've been off gluten-free um, grains, corn, for about eight months. If you've still got problems and you've been grain-free and you're still having gastroesophageal reflux, um, one of the issues that I see is that people damage their intestines or stomach 
And even though they go gluten-free, the damage is still there. And one of the reasons the damage is still there is because they're malnourished and they don't have the vitamins and minerals necessary to heal the damage. Even though they've taken away what caused the damage, they're malnourished to the level that their body doesn't have the capacity to heal the damage. And um, so one of the things that can be very helpful that you can try, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just draw you a general diagram here. Let's say that, you know, so this is, this is kind of a diagram of the stomach. This is the esophagus. And this is stomach. And this is the small intestine, right? So with, with problems like GERD, um, what happens is you get irritants that leach up through that valve and they can cause heart, what, what people call heartburn. And sometimes what happens is gluten damages the cells and the lining of the stomach because the stomach on top of that cell, you, you create a mucus lining that's produced. And that mucus is there and it protects us. But what happens is gluten damages directly that mucus. And so you get little erosions in the mucus. And so your stomach's job is to make acid. Well, acid uh, is your, your stomach protects itself from its own acid production by having this mucus layer. But if gluten has destroyed or damaged that mucus layer, then every time you make acid, you're irritating the cells that are not being protected. And that can cause kind of a persistent GERD. So one of the things that can be very, very helpful is taking a supplemental product that creates like a mimicking membrane. So it creates basically a mucus-like barrier temporarily. And so these products are called mucilaginous products. And so examples of mucilaginous products would be things like deglycerinized licorice, marshmallow, aloe. These are all great things that you can do naturally that can kind of help coat and line the stomach, you know, temporarily, again, this is not a permanent fix, it's just a temporary support um, that, that might be helpful as your body's trying to heal and repair. I've, I've, I have a, a, a mucilaginous product called GI Soothe that you can check out as well. We'll put a link up for you, but um, GI Soothe is a mucilaginous, a mixture of different mucilaginous that can help put a barrier down. But you may have other things going on too. You may have an H. pylori infection and that you should see your doctor and get that ruled out because H. pylori oftentimes is a bacteria that can drill holes in your mucus barrier and make GERD uh, kind of a reality for you. There are other food sensitivities, food allergies that can also cause that. If you haven't been checked for, you probably want to get checked for. Zinc deficiency, vitamin A deficiency makes it impossible to heal the stomach. Yeah, after gluten-induced damage. So if you've got certain nutritional deficiencies, those can also continue to wreak havoc on you. So, you know, again, getting those types of things measured because otherwise, again, you're flying blind and you can use a mucilaginous and it might help you temporarily, but you really want to get to the root cause. You want to figure out why that's still there. Is lymphocytic colitis tied to celiac and gluten sensitivity? Absolutely it is. It's one of the cancers we know gluten can cause. Uh, lymphocytic colitis not, I'm sorry, that's not a cancer. I was think, thinking more about, um, about lymphoma, but lymphocytic colitis, which is lymphocyte infiltration into the colon, creating an inflammatory response, can definitely be linked to gluten and other food allergies as well. I've even seen caffeine do it. I've seen non anti-inflammatory drugs for pain do it. So lots of things can cause lymphocytic colitis, not just gluten, but gluten is one that can. Um, let's see, if you've taken one of those tests and it didn't come up positive with gluten sensitivity, would that be accurate? Which one of those tests, Amy? I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, if you're talking about one of those blood tests and it came up um, positive, then you definitely are positive. But if you took one of those blood tests and it came up negative, it doesn't mean you're not gluten sensitive um, because those tests can have a false negative. There are some practitioners that claim that the only problem with gluten is a lack of mucosa and good bacteria. What would you say about that, please? I would say it's a pipe dream, um, and I would welcome a debate with any one of those practitioners. Um, it, the reality is, is we've had celiac disease. The oldest known medical recording of celiac disease is 2000 BC. So this isn't something that, I mean, 2000 BC, we're talking about before GMOs, we're talking about before pesticides, there's a lot of people that claim that it's all about glyphosate and there's no such thing as gluten sensitivity and that, that's not true either. Um, gluten sensitivity is very real and if you've ever, if you, if you have it or you've ever experienced it, you know what I'm talking about and it's not just about a lack of mucosa and good bacteria. Um, 
Now, does a lack of mucosa and good bacteria accelerate gluten reaction? It sure does. And I did an entire module on gluten acceleration a couple of weeks ago. And if you, I would encourage you to go back and watch that because that might help you understand that topic a little bit better. Um, let's see here. Can gluten affect a condition called dysphonia? I have a client diagnosed with it, and she has been told um, her vocal cords are bowed rather than parallel. She has had years of gluten exposure. Yes, I've seen this in several singers, actually, um, where dysphonia was ruining their career, inflaming their vocal cords. Now, that being said, dysphonia has other causes as well. I've seen cases where tumors were growing. I've seen cases where you know the thyroid had a mass and that was pushing in on the cord. So it's not the only thing, but gluten definitely can contribute to dysphonia. I've seen it a number of times in patients. Um, yeah, so, so follow up to that question, which is she's noticed improvements on a gluten-free diet, but needs to constantly clear her throat. So you need to get her checked for additional food sensitivities because there could be other things that she's eating that are causing a mucus uh, production. And that mucus production is generally why people have to repetitively clear their throat. And there are certain foods that will stimulate mucus production. What does mucus production mean? It means your immune system is producing more mucus to protect you from what you just ate. And so dairy is a very common mucus producing food. And a lot of singers know this, why they won't drink dairy or eat cheese, et cetera, before a show, um, because it, it, will, it will disrupt their ability to sing. But you can, again, there are other foods that can cause that beyond dairy. And that, that's something that you should ask her or encourage her to get tested for. Now let's go down on both sides. Do you have a supplement to help avoid C. diff when on an antibiotic? Yeah, ultrabiotic defense is probably one of the best things you can do. If you're taking an antibiotic, you should be also taking a very high dose probiotic, not at the same time you're taking the antibiotic. So like if you're on an antibiotic and you take that antibiotic in the morning, don't take the probiotic with the antibiotic in the morning because you're, you're gonna neutralize some of its effect. But take the, take the probiotic, try to get it three to four hours away from the antibiotic. But as long as you're on an antibiotic, you should definitely be taking a strong probiotic. And the one I would recommend that, that we produce at Gluten-Free Society is, is called Ultrabiotic Defense. Um, I just need a Dr. Osborne camp to be locked up for 15 days. We're working on it. We're working on a, a camp, maybe maybe soon in the near future. Not 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 too near, but it's it's something we're we're actually looking at designing as a camp for people to detox in a rapid fashion and really see the power of diet change. Um, let's see here. My friend's 29 month old, weighs 18 pounds. The doctor just get, has given her um, ciproheptadine to increase appetite and high caloric commercial shakes. None of these are helping. Of course, they're not. High calorie commercial shakes are foolish. Well, excuse my language, they're full of garbage. Um, none of these are helping. What would be a good source of action? What tests? Should she ask for, can she be started on ultra kids? She can, she can definitely be started on ultra kids, but if she's underweight, and that's what, there's a name for that, Morgiana. It's called FTT, right? Failure to thrive, FTT. What causes FTT? This is how celiac is a lot of times diagnosed in babies and in infants, is that they're not thriving. And the reason why is celiac causes a polyglandular disease where it affects hormone production. So you get different glands like your, your pituitary gland and your thyroid gland. Um, and so these individuals don't produce hormones adequately and so they don't grow. And eating, eating the, like the Pediasure and all the nonsense, like, gosh, I, we could do a whole show about that garbage. But what are those products made out of? Those high calorie shakes that doctors oftentimes recommend. What's the number one ingredient? Corn syrup. Look at it. Number one ingredient predominantly is corn syrup or processed whey or soy protein that's genetically modified. And, and, 
and sugar, right? Do, you know, the number one rule to good health is you cannot get healthy eating food that isn't healthy. You can't restore healthy eating things that aren't healthy. So those shakes, in my opinion, that's malpractice, right? Recommending those shakes. That's just an ignorant doctor not knowing anything about nutrition, trying to play it at nutrition. They shouldn't be doing that. Um, but what you can do for that, for that child is get the right testing done. Talk with the docs about doing food sensitivity testing, testing for gluten sensitivity, testing for nutrition status, because sometimes vitamin mineral deficiencies will also cause failure to thrive. And this way, at least you can get that child nourished appropriately based on objective data versus based on, well, let's just throw every garbage drink at them in the book and just make sure we get calories up. Calories do not good weight create, right? Calories, there's a quality to calories. It's not just about uh, a quantity, we need X amount of calories. There's a quality to every calorie that's consumed. And some calories will rape you of nutrients. They will actually steal your nutrients away from you, especially high sugar, empty calorie protein drinks designed to put weight on people. They don't ever work because they're, they're mal they actually serve to malnourish you because of the sugar content. Sorry, I get fired up about that stuff because that's child abuse in my opinion when doctors make that kind of recommendation. How long does it take for the whole guy to clear up from dysbiosis? Is a water fast the fastest to start uh, to jumpstart a big turnover? Can be. Um, it, a water fast can be a quick jump start, but the problem with a water fast is you can't fast forever. And the second you start reintroducing food, if you don't know what you're actually reacting to, then, then you can start reintroducing food that create problems right away again. And so everything you did that was helpful when you fasted just starts coming back when you start reintroducing food. So it's always important if you're, if you're struggling to work with somebody who knows how to do the right kind of testing to help you alter and change your diet in a manner that's consistent with not creating an inflammatory process in your gut. Hey, if you've got a functional medicine or health question that you'd like me to answer for you, make sure you send me an email, glutenology at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to create a video answer just for you. Have a great day.